welcome to Obsession Engineering and welcome back to my 1998 Yamaha R1 Jigsaw Puzzle Project. Now last time I had an episode of this, which is admittedly a few weeks ago because life and work have got in the way, I actually got to test ride the bike and in general it was pretty good, but there were a couple of foibles. The biggest one of these really was the fact that when you pulled the front brake there was quite a lot of juddering going on. So that is number one thing to try and fix today. Then if I get enough of that done, I might also have a look at the carburation because just when you shut the throttle at junctions and bits, it doesn't drop back to idle particularly well. So it might be sucking in a little bit of air or have a slightly odd carb setting. So they're the two things that I'm going to try and sort first. Being as the brakes should really be quite important on a bike, today they are definitely number one priority. Now, from a distance, the brake discs look fine, and I actually don't think they're warped. I think what's happened is, when it's been sat for quite a long time, I think a little bit of damper's got in, and the sort of sintered bits inside the pad, the sort of metal bits inside the brake pad, have actually corroded to the brake disc. And so you're left with this pitting on the disc. And I think what's happening is, as this pa passes through the pad, it's got a different coefficient of, frish, coefficient of friction, easy for me to say, than the rest of the disc. And so I think this is causing the judder. So we've got a little bit of it on this side. And if I go around to the other side, it's done it on this side as well. And I think this is pretty common. Yeah, it's just down here we can see it. This side's not as bad. So what I've done is I've ordered another set of brake pads off eBay. They were quite cheap. Delivered to me, they were £24 for a pair. So they may not be perfect, they may be no better than these, but they're worth a try at that price. And then if I ride it and it's still no better, I'll actually pod out and buy some blingy Brembos or PFMs or something like that. So first job today, I'm going to take the front wheel out and uh, put some new brake discs on. The first step to taking the wheel out is to take the brake calipers off. And then I had an idea. To double check for warpage, I'm just going to give the discs a little bit of a spin with a DTR set on them. That's a dial test indicator. Everybody just calls them clocks. It's not really the right term, but I use it quite regularly. So here we go. You'll always get a little bit of fluctuation because very few things in life are perfectly flat. But that's pretty good. Anything under about quarter of a millimetre is all right, and quarter of a millimetre on here will be... Uh, about 10 thou, I think. Yeah, that sounds right. So this side's okay. I'll just double check the other side. All right, left hand side's all right. Let's just check the right hand side. Yeah, so the maximum there's about five or six thou, which is about half as much as I'd think you'd probably actually notice. So I think that's looking pretty good. Apart from the discs are in fact no good. So the next thing I'll do is take the front wheel out and swap the discs. To take the wheel out is pretty simple. Just undo the pinch bolts and wind the spindle out. So here are my £24 brake discs off eBay. And if I'm honest, they're probably in worse condition than the ones I'm taking off. They've got exactly the same sort of pitting in them. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to change them anyway because I've got them now. And that will actually confirm if they've still got the brake jitter that this is the problem. So it'll be nice to double check it, and for 24 quid I'm willing to take the risk. And then if they're no good at all, they'll make an interesting wall clock or something. So down to the actual job. It is pretty simple changing brake discs. Just undo the bolts down here, they hold the disc on, take the disc off, make sure the mounting points are fairly clean, put the new disc on, a little bit of Loctite and torque the bolts up. Simples. So that's my new old brake disc fitted. I've just given them a little bit of a rub over with an oil stone to make sure there's sort of no high spots on them and to break some of the old sort of pad material up that would be on the surface. I've then given them a very very thorough cleaning with some brake cleaner. All the bolts are sort of lightly loctited and then torqued up. So it's time to put that back in there. So my wheels back in. I've checked the discs aren't warped and they're pretty much exactly the same as the old ones. Um, so it is really a case of I need to test ride it, but it is currently piddling down with rain outside. And being as there's a fairly good chance I haven't fixed it, I may as well go on to trying to not fix something else. The next thing to fail to fix is buried in there. 
It's something to do with carburettors. So on the test ride, what was happening was, when you were dropping down to low RPM, you were sort of revving the bike a little bit, and as you dropped down, it would sort of hover at a sort of two, two and a half thousand RPM, and after maybe five or ten seconds, it eventually would actually drop down to normal idle, which is obviously a little bit odd, and it's not supposed to do that. Now, it's distinctly possible that it's sucking air in around the carburettor somewhere, like an inlet rubber split or something like that, or the carbs are set wrong. So I'm going to have to get into the carbs to find out. So it's going to be the seat off, and that leads us on to the other story. The spare seat pad I had has been sort of re-foamed, so it's actually correct. I'm just really, really struggling to find the right grade of red vinyl to go on it. This just, you can lose hours and hours of your life looking at seat vinyl. So, seat off, tank off, then I can get to the uh, airbox and bit, airbox off, and then I shall rig up a, like a dummy fuel tanker, like a colostomy bag, so that I can run fuel into the carbs and have it running with no fuel tank on. Then I can fiddle around with things to my heart's content, or at least until I get gas in the workshop. The joys of old bikes on carburettors is there's not that much electrical to disconnect, so the tank and the airbox and bits come off really quite easily. So that I can run the bike for a reasonable length of time and get some temperature in it, I have set up this off-skid fuel tank, this off-bike tank. And then I've also opened the main front door so that I've got some air in it and I don't gas myself too quickly. Choke on. The speeder will do that because it's telling me the fuel tank's disconnected. There we go, we're running. I'm going to have to let it warm up for a little bit just to uh, sort of get a normal reading on it and get it off the choke. Right, so this is the sort of problem we're getting into. You see, I let go of the throttle and it sits at 2000 RPM for a little bit. It's a little bit annoying that with the fuel tank disconnected, it whaps all over the place and tells me there's a fault. But your tick over is sort of 13, 1400 RPM, which is about right. But if I give it a bit of a rev, it then holds on to its RPM for a little bit. So what I'm going to do next is squirt a bit of brake cleaner around the uh, around the bottom of the carb, around the inlet rubbers, and see if that makes any difference. Now the idea of this is that if there's any gaps in the inlet rubbers, it'll suck the brake cleaner in, and it should actually sort of start behaving itself or misbehave even more. Either way, we'll know something. Ah, straight away. I've donned my black gloves because I don't really want petrol all over my hands and I also have my allen keys handy and I'm going to get under here into the carb rubbers, disconnect the carb rubbers and just pop the carbs off. Now I'm going to try and do this with the throttle cables and bits still connected and just sort of lift the carbs up and have a look at what the inlet rubbers look like, make sure all the rest of the clamps the bottom halves are tight, just give it a general check over. Getting to the clamps for the carbs is a little bit fiddly, but nothing we can't handle with a little bit of swearing. So this is one of the inlet rubbers, it's off number one cylinder, and it's a little bit damp because I've been spraying stuff around it. But what I'm going to do is give it a bit of a dry off, give it a bit of a clean, and I'm just going to sort of give it a bit of a massage and see if I can see if there's any splits or cracks in it. If there isn't, what I might do is just give it a very, very thin bead of sort of silicon round here and actually pop it back on just to make sure the silicon hopefully will just give us a really, really nice tight seal onto the engine. And then at least one side of it, I'll be confident, isn't leaking. So I've had all four carb rubbers off, and interestingly the lefts were on the right and the rights were on the left because they are actually labelled, and they were the wrong way round. So I've now reset them left, left, right, right, and that makes it considerably easy to get to the screws to do them up. Now I will admit, one of them, for number two cylinder, the one that attaches to the engine wasn't quite as tight as it probably should be, so it is possible that that was maybe sucking a little bit in. 
But they are all now reconnected. I've put a smear of silicon under them, so they should seal very well now. At least on the engine side, I haven't bothered on the carb side. <sighs> right, let's press the start button and see if it's any better. Fuel pump's just priming. Yeah, that's not really any better. Right, what I'm going to do next is attempt to actually balance the carbs up and see if that helps the job along a little bit. So to balance the carburetors, I've connected a carb balancer. Now this thing has little tubes in it which connect to these little tubes which connect down here to little holes in the inlet tracks that normally have screws in them to block them off. And these read the negative pressure inside the inlet tract. So as the engine's running, on the, sucks, on the suck stroke of a four-stroke, it sucks down, creates negative pressure in the inlet tract, and that draws the fuel in. And that negative pressure will read on here as it sucks, basically as it's going to suck these little columns of mercury up. And ideally, we want all four of these columns to be the same, so that each engine is sucking the same. So, to make that happen, I'm going to lift this little rubber flap up, and underneath there, there are little screws, so we can adjust the throttle plates in the carbs, and that basically restricts or opens up the throttle plate, uh, like the throttles, a little bit, and alters how much air can get in, thus how much negative pressure is in the inlet tract. Hopefully that all makes sense. So you do it with the engine warm, which it already is fairly warm, and somewhere near idle, maybe just a little bit over, to get a clear reading. So the easiest one to get to, to show you, is down here, is the little screw down here. And we actually go in from underneath with the screwdriver up to there to get to the screw. Now, in effect, what we're doing is we're altering how one throttle sits against the next one along. And so in the end, when they're all correct, they will be balanced. And so hence the term balancing the uh, carburettors. So we better start her up and get some sucky sucky on the go. So you can see on the gauges here that they're not massively uneven, but there's, there's a little bit of variation between them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in and just tweak the throttle valves a little bit and see if I can get them to run correctly together. And then hopefully it won't do the thing that it's doing right now of speeding up and slowing down on its own. Well, after a few minutes of fiddling, that's about as close as I can get them. Which, according to the manual that comes with the carb tune, is pretty darn good. Well, that seems considerably better. I think what I ought to do now is really um, take the carb tune off, put the air box back on, and see if it's actually any better with the air box on it. So here we go, I have the air box and the tank and everything back on. See if that makes a difference to it, because it seemed not too bad earlier. No, nope, that's definitely hanging on. So what I can definitely say today is that I've not fixed that. I've probably not fixed the brakes. I've definitely not fixed the carburetion. <sighs> I think it's just being one of those days. Like a dog with a bone, I just couldn't quite give up. Although I should really just pack up and go home, I didn't. So I thought, I'll just take the uh, baffle out of the exhaust pipe and see if that makes any difference, which it didn't. And then I thought, I better just check the manual and the air screws in the bottom of the carburetors, which are an absolute pig to get to, what they call the pilot screws, were set at three turns out and they should have been at two and a half. So I gave them a little bit of an adjustment. <laughs> And it's not perfect. But it is considerably better. So I think maybe another little tweak of the uh, pilot screws another day, we might have that about cracked. So I think that goes to prove that as clever as I think I am sometimes looking for faults in stuff that don't exist, what I maybe should do is actually read the workshop manual. And on that note, I'm going to go home for the day. This can stay on the bench and, um, yeah, it can have a little bit more TLC another day.